The Trumpet Daily with Stephen Flurry. Hello again, everyone, and welcome back to the Trumpet Daily radio show. It's great to be back uh, with you. Appreciate, uh, who was it? Richard Palmer, of course. I saw just the, the first five to ten minutes of his show yesterday, so we appreciate him uh, helping out during a very busy uh, SEP period. We uh, just concluded the, th- the first three-day um, skills day for uh, for basketball that's the the program that i've been uh, helping with along with uh, i think seven or eight other workers so uh that's two hours a day of uh, of basketball these past three days where we've had the same campers so uh they were able to choose that as their sport for uh, the morning or the afternoon and uh, so it just gave them a little extra time to put toward drills and uh, some scrimmaging at the end of those uh those practices and uh, hopefully they all saw some improvement. I certainly uh, saw some improvement across the board as well. So we've been having those uh, two-hour clinics each day, that for uh, basketball, for uh, rugby for the girls, uh, flag football for the boys. Uh, and then in, in another couple of days, we'll be having, uh, I think, some volleyball clinics, uh, softball clinics as well. So quite a lot of opportunity for, uh, for the young people to get better at a sport that they really like. A few comments that have come in in response to the show. Uh, This one here says, So inspiring. I'm nearing the end of the Old Testament once again and surprised at how much I don't remember. I'm now determined to write it all out. That's something we stressed the other day at the end of the show. To write out the scriptures, the questions um, from the correspondence course. Uh, This person here sounds like they might just be writing it out, period, all of the the Bible. In any event, it says, from beginning to end, Old and New Testaments, thank you once again. Another one here says, I look forward to hearing the updates on SEP. Thank you for your hard work and dedication to this show. And then another one finally says, my greatest achievement is being part of this great work of God and knowing the truth of God and going through the HWA Correspondence Bible course. So some good feedback there coming from listeners who are plowing through the Correspondence course. This is something uh, I know, too, once I get back to the UK, I really want to try to stress on the TV program over there. They typically, when we do advertise the Correspondence course, by the way, the the response level is usually lower than uh, for other booklets that we offer in any event. Uh, if someone does start it and stay with it, what a foundation that that will be uh, spiritually. Well, some of the headlines that uh, are in the news stack today, uh, Vice President Biden, or used to be Vice President Biden, he's hired 600 lawyers um, ahead of the <clears throat> the election this November. The spectator is uh, wondering why he would do something such as that. It says, during a recent fundraiser, former Vice President Joe Biden announced that his campaign had recruited an army of 600 lawyers to prepare for expected legal battles pursuant to the upcoming election. <laughs> so they're already, re- they're already preparing to duke it out in court. They're already preparing to contest the election. Remember, they've made a big point of this, the radical left, ahead of the election in 2016. Well, President Trump, he's not going to, or Donald Trump's not going to accept the results. They're already, the other side, they're already preparing for an outcome that they won't like and that they will challenge anything and everything that they can do to return to power, just like my father has written. We've discussed... uh, uh, quite a lot here at the SEP program. Well, not quite a lot, I guess. We've focused more on the positive, and uh, I've mentioned uh, already in the last week and a half about the positive view of history. And so we've focused more on that, but we'll we'll certainly touch on the negative as part of it because it does really make the headlines from today come alive. This cancel culture, this effort to delete the past, to erase the past, the Los Angeles Times came out with a, a piece today. It's time to cancel the Star Spangled Banner. It's time to do away with the national anthem. This is not from some far left radical website. This is from the Los Angeles Times. 
It's describing the, uh, the statue that was pulled down, I think, in San Francisco. Um, it says here, the Francis Scott Key Monument, yeah, in San Francisco's Golden Gate Park, is one of those old-fashioned pieces of public art that, shall we say, lacks, uh, lays it on thick. It is imposing and fussy, a 52-foot-tall chunk of travertine and marble loaded up with classical trimmings, it says. There's a, a fluted colonnade, four eagles with majestically fanned out wings, so it's describing this, this brilliant monument. It says here, in the center of the monument is the main attraction, the bronze statue of Key, that would be Francis Scott Key, and uh, the Washington, D.C. lawyer who 206 years ago wrote the words to the Star-Spangled Banner to commemorate the American victory in the Battle of Baltimore in the War of 1812. It says Key is captured in a heroic uh, pose, enthroned on a big chair with a pen in hand, looking every inch of the sort of poetaster who would come up with lines like, or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming. It says at least this is how the monument used to appear. Today, Francis Scott Key is no longer in Golden Gate Park. On June 20th, protesters lassoed the statue with ropes, heaved and hoed, and down came Key, somersaulting off the pediment head over heels. It says Key was a slave owner, like many of the historical personages whose statues have been defaced and destroyed in the Black Lives Matter uprising that followed the May 25th killing of George Floyd. See, this is all justice for George. By the way, that statue of Edward Colston, the one that was pulled down in the UK and dumped into the harbor, I forget what city that was in, Bristol maybe, they've replaced it. They've since replaced that statue with uh, a Black Lives Matter protester. That's right. Justice for George. It's all about justice. Take down Colston, and here comes this BLM protester. So ridiculous. Well, we've focused, as I say, on the positives. Going back to that L.A. Times piece, they, uh, they're suggesting, if we get rid of the Star Spangled Banner, they're suggesting that we replace it, or there's some that have suggested Imagine by the Beatles. <laughs> the Beatles. The new, uh, the new national anthem for the United States of America. Or, or the song Lean On Me. And the LA Times, I mean, they're serious. They're, they list off the lyrics. Lean on me. That's what they want to sing now. In honor of the United States of America. Can't be the Star Spangled Banner. Because Francis Scott Key was a slave owner. Everything gets canceled. And, of course, the, the major media, they're all on board with it. Like I say, that's the L.A. Times. The Los Angeles Times, the National Review, by the way, is calling out the New York Times. They got all excited about this uh, individual that supposedly died in Texas. He was a young man, so it fit their narrative perfectly. He was 30 years old, I believe it was. He uh, supposedly went to a COVID party and then told his, uh, his doctor... I regret doing that. I just thought it was, I believed it was a hoax. I ended up going. I got the disease. And well, the, the Times tells us that that individual died. He died. National Review says, a closer look showed, a closer look at this story, by the way, showed that not only were there no names mentioned, but there was no date or location of the party and no other sources about where and whether it happened. And then there was the curious fact that a dying man's self-incriminating final words were relayed to the press. Who gave permission for that? It says, in fact, the story seems to have changed several times since publication in order to salvage the Times' own credibility. The story has been transformed, edit by edit, from one of a man who died by taking a foolish risk in which the doctor was the only source to a story about the questionable claim a doctor is making. So the New York Times now is backtracking because it was just one doctor that told the story. And the, the press, of course, ran with it. He was wrong for believing it was a hoax. 
He shouldn't have gone out to the COVID party. Had he gone out to a protest, of course, that's a different story. But he went to the COVID party. And then he died. And well, here's the New York Times, as it often has to do. Backtracking quickly. Barry Weiss, by the way, resigned from the New York Times. Uh, the, <laughs> I guess that's a he, she, I don't know. <laughs> the editor of the opinion section. She, she's a, yeah, it's a she I see in my notes. She's a centrist, she says. In any event, she, um, she wrote on her website why, basically, she was re- resigning. And it says here, instead, of, uh, instead, a new consensus has emerged in the press, but perhaps especially at this paper, the New York Times, that truth isn't a process of collective discovery, but an orthodoxy already known to an enlightened few whose job is to inform everyone else. It says Twitter is not on the masthead of the New York Times, but Twitter has become its ultimate editor. So she's saying that the New York Times has basically surrendered to the mob, and she's tired of being bullied herself. And so she's walking away. It's just become a propaganda machine, the New York Times. And here she is exposing it. It says, now, history itself is one more ephemeral uh, thing molded to fit the needs of the predetermined narrative. They're going now and revising the history, the cancel culture. She says, my, my own forays into wrong think have made me the subject of constant bullying by colleagues who disagreed with my views. They've called me a Nazi and a racist. I've learned to brush off comments about how I'm writing about the the Jews again. She says there are terms for all of this, unlawful discrimination, hostile work environment, and constructive discharge. I'm no legal expert, but I know this is wrong. She says this is wrong what's happening. Here's an insider, and you've heard some of the other stories about the New York Times coming under pressure from the mob. Why did you allow this op-ed piece? Why did you write this? Here's Barry Weiss, the opinion editor. She says, the paper of record is more and more the record of those living in a distant galaxy, one whose concerns are profoundly removed from the lives of most people. They're just totally out of touch. It's like they're on another planet. One whose concerns are profoundly removed from the lives of most people, the major media, they, their response, by the way, to uh, President Trump's, he had a, an hour-long speech in the Rose Garden just yesterday. And uh, here is, I think this is Newsbusters that pulled together this montage of the media reaction, clip one. How badly uh, is he failing right now in dealing with this spiraling crisis? He's doing terribly. I mean, the president gets an F in terms of uh, the handling of this global pandemic. You see in some of these states uh, across the country, the cases are going up. He was rambling all over the place, uh, uh, not expressing coherent thoughts for the most part. And then secondly, he avoided the issue that is uh, uh, convulsing the country right now, uh, which is the coronavirus. This has now been in the United States uh, for half of a year. And the president uh, has not uh, uh, shown any indication in the last few days that uh, he's got a plan for ameliorating this brush fire. I've never seen a president uh, turn uh, the Rose Garden into a campaign rally in the way that President Trump did over the last uh, more than an hour. Uh, This this was obviously the campaign rally he wanted to have in New Hampshire that his campaign wasn't able to have. You can just go through uh, line by line, section uh, by section of what the president had to say here in in all almost the same fashion we do with the campaign rallies uh, to debunk, uh, you know, the myths, the lies. What a low energy speech from uh, this presidency, a lack of urgency uh, in terms of what his vision for the next four years uh, is kind of a r- rambling uh, incoherently, I thought, uh, going at Joe Biden. And this president uh, has, has basically uh, failed the American public in terms of how he's doing uh, with the coronavirus uh, pandemic. At every turn, uh, he has failed more of the same from the major media reacting to what the president said there about uh, COVID-19. Of course, he's been uh, talking more about 
what he has done, what he did back in January and February, the travel bans and so on. He's taking, by the way, he's taking all the scaremongering from back in March and he's turning it against the media. They're the ones that said, if you don't do this and this, millions are going to die. Millions are going to die. Well, now the curve has been flattened. And uh, President Trump's calling on schools to reopen. He's saying that, you know, Dr. Fauci's a nice guy, but he's made mistakes. They've all made mistakes, the experts. But like I say, he's using what the experts were forecasting just a couple, three months ago and saying, well, if that was the, the forecast, look at what we've done. It's tragic that 130 some thousand have died, but it's certainly not millions and millions. Here's a, a little bit from the, the president's speech in the Rose Garden yesterday, clip two. We would have had thousands of people additionally die if we let people come in from heavily infected China. But we stopped it. We did a travel ban in January. Nancy Pelosi was dancing in the streets of Chinatown in San Francisco a month later, and even later than that. And others, too. They all thought what I did was a terrible mistake. We would have lost. In fact, Dr. Fauci said he would have lost thousands of additional people if President Trump had to do that. And I was a crowd of one because even experts didn't want to do it. They thought it was a mistake. And then I did Europe when I started seeing what was going on in Italy and Spain and France and other countries in Europe. I did a ban on people coming in from Europe. That would have been disastrous for our country also. And we saved tens of thousands of lives, but we actually saved millions of lives by closing. By closing up, we saved millions, potentially millions of lives. Could be a number that we're actually working on, but it could be two to three million lives. So we're at 135,000, which is terrible. One is too much. But we would have had millions of people dead from this curse that came at us. Think about uh, earlier in the year, he takes those actions, he closes down the borders or stops travel coming in from China or Europe. And Joe Biden, the press, all of them, the experts, they all criticized him. You, you don't need to do that. We don't need to wear masks. You don't want to, you don't want to alienate China. And he's right. Nancy Pelosi, she was out dancing in the streets. Mayor de Blasio out in the streets. And then fast forward a few months and he starts to, to reopen some things or he's at least calling for it. It's really up to the states in most cases. And he's criticized for that. Meanwhile, Andrew Cuomo, the governor of New York, a third, no, I think a fourth Almost a third, a fourth of the total deaths in the United States have happened in New York State. And so naturally, as I've pointed out, Governor Cuomo is celebrated as a genius. He's managed it perfectly. Yesterday, he was on TV offering help to the mayor of Atlanta because, well, New York has done such a fine job of getting this under control. Here's what he said to uh, the Atlanta mayor, clip three. You are, you are on exactly the right uh, track. Anything we can do to help, we're at a stable period now. We have the virus way down low. We went from the worst infection rate in the country to the best infection rate, the lowest. So uh, we have a little breathing space here. Anything we can do for you that you need, any uh, uh, help on the uh, testing, setting up the taste testing and the tracing. That is so, so important. Uh, and we've been through that. So you have an open offer, whatever you need. So that's the governor of New York offering help to other states with testing, tracing and whatever. And of course, the president's the one that's been behind that as well. Something like 45 million Americans now have been tested. It's incredible that that amount of people that's a large segment of the entire population. And no wonder more and more positives are being found. Even though the death rate has flattened, clearly it has flattened. 
New York, by the way, the governor there that you just heard from, he tweeted out yesterday about this New York Tough poster, and it's basically a visual showing this, uh, this 111-day journey that New York has gone through to flatten the curve. And it's, it's celebrating the way New York handled this crisis. Keep in mind, keep in mind, 32, 33,000 New Yorkers died because of coronavirus. Here's Andrew Cuomo yesterday basically taking a, a victory lap on uh, how he handled the crisis. Clip four. What we went through and what we did was historic because we did tame the beast. We did turn the corner. We did plateau that mountain. And then we came down the other side. And they will be talking about what we did for decades to come. Well, they, they certainly will be talking about it for decades to come, but not for the reasons that he, uh, he, he thinks. For decades to come, they're going to be talking about the disastrous leadership that caused tens of thousands of deaths, specifically the March 25th directive that sent COVID positive cases into elderly care centers. That was a, a directive that he later rescinded, quietly, by the way. Even Jake Tapper, the liberal, the far left liberal on CNN, even he was shocked that the mayor of New York, or rather the governor of New York, could come out and take this victory lap, given the numbers, given the number of people who have died. This was Jake Tapper's reaction to this New York uh, uh, tough poster just yesterday. Clip five. New York's Democratic governor, Andrew Cuomo, seems to be on something of a victory tour, congratulating the state and himself for defeating the virus, even selling this poster, which shows his state getting over the mountain by bringing down the curve during the 111 days of hell, as the governor put it. The poster includes references to his daughters and a boyfriend, little inside jokes. There are no illustrations, however, of the more than 32,000 dead New Yorkers the highest death toll by far of any state. No rendering on that poster of criticism that Governor Cuomo ignored warnings, no depiction of the study that he could have saved thousands of lives had he and Mayor de Blasio acted sooner. No painting there on the poster of his since rescinded order that nursing homes take all infected patients in. That's Jake Tapper yesterday, just leveling uh, Governor Cuomo, who incredibly comes out with this poster and wants to sell it even and is bragging on TV about how he's handled this crisis. He really, he really and truly believes all the positive coverage that he's getting from his brother, who, who also works at CNN. He really believes it. He's telling the Atlanta mayor, look, we're here to help you. We've done it. We've, we've conquered the beast. We have overcome this obstacle. And even Jake Tapper, if you can't get Jake Tapp Tapper to, to agree with you, something's, something's wrong. In the UK, Richard's been uh, following the news on, uh, on that side of the Atlantic regarding COVID-19, where it's just basically uh, non-existent now. And finally, over there, the shops are beginning to reopen. Yet they're not talking so much, the press that is, they're not talking so much about this second wave because there isn't a second wave. So now, Richard has noticed, now they're starting to move toward, uh, well, it's going to come back in the winter. And it's going to be a disaster, of course. The experts are saying that this winter in the UK, 120,000 people could die. So we're going through this again. The Neil Ferguson model. Again, the scaremongers are out in, in full force saying that we're going to have to wear masks probably through to the spring of next year. We have to. There's a second wave. There's a third wave. There's the winter wave that we've got to prepare for. This article, I forget where it's from, but it, it says the risk could be reduced if we take action immediately. So it's, it's another Neil Ferguson model, basically. 
Toby Young at The Telegraph. He says, I'm afraid that this report looks uh, suspiciously like propaganda, like a propaganda exercise to try to make compulsory face mask nappies appear more uh, reasonable. There's quite a few conservatives that are just disgusted with the party and disgusted with uh, the prime minister for even for even discussing the possibility of of compulsory face mask wearing you have to wear the face mask the spectator pointed out that winston churchill refused to enforce uh carrying the the gas mask during world war ii when britain was being bombed he of course encouraged it he said if you're going to go out you better you better you really need to carry a gas mask but even then they didn't force people to do it and that's coming under discussion now a sign of the times compulsory face masks are proof this is from the telegraph it's a headline they're proof the british bulldog has become a scaredy cat of europe it says makes uh, masks suppress human interaction but their ability to suppress covid is less clear who would want them to be part of our normal world? Well, there's more and more people who actually want that. We've uh, commented, too, about Melanie Phillips. She's, she's really on board with the, the house arrest, quarantine, keeping people at home. She wrote a piece at the, uh, the time saying that the right has turned on me for daring to disagree. So this is Melanie Phillips, sadly, <laughs> in some ways, parting parting ways with the right because of her strong stance on COVID-19. Basically, she she's out there saying that the, the well, there's just going to be thousands and thousands of deaths if we don't, if we don't hole up in our houses. When we come back, we'll get through a study. I think I gave this toward the end of last week with the campers at SEP on the heart, the teenage heart of David. You're listening to Stephen Flurry, and this is the Trumpet Daily Radio Show. If you'd like to email the program, you can send comments to td at kpcg.fm. We'll be right back. This is KPCG-FM, and this is the Trumpet Daily Could anything be more mysterious than the question of the unseen spirit world? Angelic beings have always been a mystery to people on the earth. Do angels actually exist? Is there, in fact, a Satan, the devil? Is Satan a literal, immortal being? Did God create a devil? To understand more about the mystery of angels and evil spirits, be sure to request Herbert W. Armstrong's masterful work, Mystery of the Ages. To learn more, please visit thetrumpet.com. The Trumpet Daily. I mentioned last week on the, the show the verse in Acts 13 where it says that David had a heart like God's and he wanted to fulfill God's will, all of it, as my father wrote in the former prophets. He said, the, the true, he said true religion revolves around the family throne of David. David. God's people are training even now to share that throne with him. So this is why the Bible has so much history about that throne and so much about David himself the throne of David it's of course it's God's throne and God wants us to wrap our minds around that vision ruling with Christ forever but when he calls it the throne of David and points us to the example of David I mean that's something we can really identify with David was just an ordinary sheep herder. He was just out in the fields when he was a youth. 
tending to the sheep, and obviously doing a lot of other amazing things as far as developing his talents was concerned, meditating on God's purpose and plan, praying to God, writing music, learning to play the harp. 1 Samuel 16 and verse 18, this is when, uh, this is uh, around the time of his being anointed, but it's also this transition period from Saul to David. Saul, of course, started out on the right foot and then really took a turn for the worse two, three years into his conversion. And this transition period, David was the one who was brought in to try to soothe and comfort Saul's troubled mind. Verse 18 of 1 Samuel 16, it says, Then answered one of the servants and said, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, that is cunning and playing, and a mighty man, a mighty valiant man, it says, and a, a man of war, and prudent in matters, and a comely person, it says, and the Lord is with him. So that's a beautiful little biographical sketch of David, a young David, a skilled musician, it says there, really a, a musical genius in, in so many ways. It says he was prudent in matters. That could be translated better as skillful in speech. He was an excellent communicator. It says a man of war. He was a courageous warrior. He went right after a lion and a bear. I uh, pointed out to the campers that there's a commentary, Clark's commentary, that, that basically says that this Ha this whole passage really is about when David was young, but it says that this one verse is probably kind of out of the time order of things because it had to have been much later in life that David uh, picked up all of these abilities and talents. Clark's commentary, you see, you just can't understand that there would be a, a young man, this gifted, but he was young and he was gifted. My father writes in the form of prophets, it says, pay, please pay close attention to this verse. And he, he goes to the verse I just read to you, 1 Samuel 16, 18. And then he says, read it again. This was a teenager. This was a teenager he was talking about. What a reputation David had built. What a reputation this young man had. Another translation of this verse, 1 Samuel 16 and verse 18, it says, I have seen a son of Jesse of Bethlehem, a skillful musician, a fine dancer, a gentleman, and a good reciter, and a handsome man, and the ever-living is with him. God is with him. That's what made him so special, of course. He brought God into his activities. He, he brought God into his hobbies. David, as Acts 13 says, a man after God's own heart, he was, as I, as I told the, the campers last week, he was also a teenager after God's own heart. A teenager after God's heart. 1 Samuel 13, just back a few chapters. Chapter 13 and verse 13, it says, And Samuel said to Saul, You have done foolishly. Who has not kept the, the commandment of the eternal your God? which he commanded you, for now would the Eternal have established your kingdom upon Israel forever. This takes us back to the tail end of uh, Saul's reign. Saul wouldn't obey God. Saul, Saul didn't follow God's instructions. Saul didn't have a heart like God's. Notice verse 14. It says, But now your kingdom shall not continue. The Eternal has sought him a man after his own heart, and the Eternal has commanded him to be captain over his people, because you have not kept that which the Eternal commanded you. You see, God's, he's always on the lookout. He's always searching for a man or for a woman after his own heart. He's always searching for a teenager who has a heart like God. He's searching for individuals that have a right attitude, that think like God, that love God, that want to bring God into their activities. Notice 1 Samuel 16, 
This is where the prophet goes to Jesse's house in search of Saul's replacement, in search of a, a man after God's own heart. And if you know anything about this passage, well, David wasn't even present. Jesse didn't even have David there in the house. He had all the other brothers, seven, eight of them, I think. But David wasn't even considered. 1 Samuel 16 and verse 7, it says, But the Eternal said to Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Eternal sees not as man sees. For man looks on the outward appearance, but the Eternal looks on the heart. God doesn't view man the way that human beings view each other. We uh, were impressed by the exterior. We're impressed by the, the surface, how it looks on the surface. God, however, looks on the heart. He evaluates us. He judges us based on our heart. What's going on in our minds? What's going on on the inside? In the former prophets, it says, pay attention to this. God doesn't look at us as the world does. He doesn't look to see if you're tall, dark, and handsome. He doesn't check whether you have a high IQ. He looks on your heart. He looks on your heart. It's a wonderful chapter in that, that book, by the way. David, a king after God's own heart. I think it's chapter 5 or 6 in the former prophets. But carrying on here in 1 Samuel 16, verse 11, it says, And Samuel said to Jesse, are uh, here all your children? And he said, There remains yet the youngest, and behold, he keeps the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and fetch him, for he will, we will not sit down until he comes in. And he sent, and he brought him in, and now he was ruddy, and with all a beautiful countenance, and goodly to look to. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. So David was the youngest of these eight brothers, he was the youngest. They didn't think he had a shot. Maybe they didn't realize how much he was doing when he was out in the field. Because he was, he was smart. He was strong. He was an outstanding musician. He was, he was talented. He was a musician, a poet. He was brave. He defended the sheep. My father told the campers last weekend about that courage of David to actually go after a lion, to actually go after a bear. Most would probably, even someone who's spiritually minded, on seeing that threat or viewing that threat, a lion going after his sheep, would probably just kneel down and pray for God to intervene somehow. David, I'm sure he prayed too, but David took off, he took at, he took off after the, the lion. And he s slew the lion. That's some kind of courage, killing a lion and a bear. And here he's not even in the house. His father, his brothers, they don't think enough of him to even in include him in the discussion. God had to intervene to make sure that David was brought in. Verse 13, it says, Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Eternal came upon David from that day forward. And so Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. So Samuel anointed David, and he left and went to Ramah. And uh, David left and went right back into the field. And his brothers, I'm sure, didn't like the fact that he was the anointed Verse 14, but the spirit of the eternal departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the eternal troubled him. So this is the context leading up to this little uh, biographical sketch in the Bible about David. His rise, David's rise, it coincided with Saul's uh, demise. Verse 15, it says, and Saul's servant said to him, behold now, an evil spirit from God troubles you. Let our Lord now command uh, your servants which are before you to seek out a man who is a cunning player on a harp. 
And it shall come to pass when the evil spirit from God is upon you, that he shall play with his hand and you shall be well. So he was being harassed by these demonic spirits, this demonic influence. And his, uh, his aide said, well, maybe someone could come along and play some soothing music for you. And then that's what, uh, again, leads into this verse, which we read, verse 18, then answered one of the servants and said, behold, I have uh, seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, that is cunning and playing, and a mighty valiant man, and a man of war, and prudent in matters, and a comely person, and the eternal is with him. God is with this man. This young man, well, Saul sends messengers to Jesse, and uh, you can read in verse 19 that here again, David's out with the sheep. He's anointed as the future king of Israel, and his brothers, his father, they send him right back out into the sheep, right back out into the fields. In the former prophets, my father writes this. It's amazing what, what a contrast there is between this man's view and that of David's own family. David's father and brothers had an extremely low view of him. Even after Samuel anointed him, they didn't esteem him highly. They put him right back, in, right back out with the sheep. It says, sometimes when a boy is cast aside like that, he'll do almost anything to please his dad. Maybe God worked things out in a way that would motivate David. And in the process, he would learn to see a father, that's father with a capital F, a spiritual father who would never view him as an outsider or outcast and would never let him down. It says, maybe that helped to really motivate David. Whatever the reason, the young man just kept working and making a strong name for himself. That's what I emphasized a lot last week. He just kept working. He made a name for himself, even as a young man. It was David's talents. It was David's abilities that got noticed. Now, they also noticed that God was with him. They also knew this aid to Saul, he also knew that the Lord is with this man. But he drew attention to all of the talents, all of the abilities of this young man, this remarkable young man. And here he came from out of a family. I don't know if you can say it was dysfunctional like so many families today. I mean, the father was there present. It was a large family, eight brothers. But he wasn't even considered and maybe this really did motivate David. You think about that example of Winston Churchill. Now, he was in a situation where his father just despised him. His father hated him. And Churchill, <laughs> he did everything that he could to try to get his father's attention, to try to win his father's love. And that motivated Churchill. Now, he got love and concern and care from, from other places, like from his nanny, but sometimes, sometimes someone who's scorned or dismissed or overlooked can really be motivated to go all out to be a success, to really go forward with God. That's what David did. Verse 21, And David came to Saul and stood before him and loved, he loved him greatly. And he became his armor bearer. Here is young David. And here is the beginning of this beautiful relationship. And it says a lot about David's character. Keep in mind, Saul at this point, he's troubled. He's mentally unstable. He's harassed by demons. And yet he's king. And the Bible says that David, the young David, loved him greatly. The heir to the throne. He loved him greatly. You don't detect any jealousy or competition at all. Instead, there's, there's respect and honor for this office, for the man occupying this office. David had the mind of God. He had a heart like God's. The teenager, David, had a heart 
like God's. That's how he was able to love Saul greatly. That's how he was able to help this man who was becoming more and more carnal with each passing day. He loved him greatly. The Spirit of God was leaving Saul, and it was filling the mind of King David, or the one who would become king, the boy who would become king. Verse 22, it says, And Saul sent to Jesse, saying, Let David, I pray you, stand before me, for he has found favor in my sight. And it came to pass when the evil spirit from God was upon Saul, that David took an harp and played with his hand, so Saul was refreshed and was well, and the evil spirit departed from him. Here's a, an example of beautiful music. It tells us a little something about the power of beautiful, beautiful music. That's something we've, we've obviously emphasized even with the recent uh, concert. But look at this young man. Look at this teenager. A teenager with a heart like God's. How did he, how did he develop that kind of a heart? Well, for one, the, the focal point of his life as a young man was the law of God. He meditated on God's law. He meditated on God's purpose and plan. Later on in life, it was David, of course, who institutionalized this, this vast network of praising, a network set up and, and established in order to praise God. You can read about that in, in Nehemiah 12, verses 23 and verse, and, and verse 24. David was out there as a young man developing his talents. Really, he was really driven and motivated what a time it was for him to be alive and to serve the living God. And as I told the, the teenagers at this camp last week, what a time it is for them to develop their talents, to grow, to grow in godly character, to build faith. Mr. Armstrong, back in 1985, talked about this as the age that counts. I mean, this is the time that really counts. There are opportunities all over the place. And so many of them are for our young people. You see the opportunities God gives to them at SEP. You see the opportunities he gives to them at Armstrong College. Mr. Armstrong wrote back in 1967, he says, yes, this world is going to end. Humanity won't be totally destroyed. God's intervention will prevent it. The earth won't blow up or evaporate or cease to exist. But the world, that is this system of society, this world's economic, social, religious, educational, and political structures are definitely going to be destroyed. They will be destroyed by the second coming of Christ. It says, but a totally new world will shine forth. Jesus Christ, with all the divine power and glory of the eternal God, will return to earth to set up the world-ruling kingdom of God. It says the world tomorrow will be God's world. We are now at the time, or rather at the end of man's world, but here even now, is the herald of the peaceful world tomorrow. It says, already in existence are two of the New World Educational Institutions. And then he refers to Ambassador College, the campus at Pasadena, the campus at uh, Brickett Wood, I think he mentioned. And you look at what we have today here in God's church, the system of education that God has raised up, raising the ruins, this beautiful campus here in Edmond, Oklahoma, just north of Oklahoma City. And then you've got the Edstone campus. You've got the Jerusalem excavations from time to time. You had the youth camp that now is the summer educational program. God is building a new world. This is the beginning of tomorrow's world. And there are opportunities all over the place for our young people to develop 
their talents and to prepare for their rulership, to prepare for their role in God's kingdom, in training for rulership. That's been the theme at this summer educational program. We've tried to get our young people to project ahead to think about the end of this world and the beginning of a new world. Think about the lifestyle in the world tomorrow. Think about what entertainment will be like. Think about what families will be like. Think about the things you'll hear on the radio. We're blessed here at this campus to have, it's not a strong signal, but it does cover the entirety of this campus, 101.3. It reaches into the, uh, I guess, the north part of Edmond as well. But it's such a wonderful blessing to be able to drive your car around campus and to know that you have access to the local radio station here at God's headquarters. Think about radio and television and the internet. Think about the news media in the world of tomorrow. Think about a society, a civilization that's established and built on the truth of God, where the word of God is the foundation of all knowledge. That world is coming. Tonight we have a formal event, the etiquette dinner, as we call it, the whole campus coming together, the whole SEP uh, camp coming together for a formal occasion for fine dining, for fine fellowship, What a lifestyle. My wife and others that have been helping her have have had a, a cooking and a baking class. And they've emphasized healthy and nutritious foods to to bake, to build fitness and physical health. Every morning the The campers, I mentioned we're going to show some video of this, so we're going to have to get some video and show it before the camp is out. But every morning at 8.15, they're in there in the gym, lined up, warming up with their exercises for 15 minutes. So many wonderful, wonderful habits and practices emphasized at this camp. And all because this is the beginning of a new world. This is the world tomorrow in embryo. Mr. Armstrong wrote back in 1949 that Ambassador College isn't paradise. It isn't the Garden of Eden. We can only vaguely imagine how beautiful must have been the garden into which God placed Adam and the beauty that shall once again appear on earth after Christ has conquered the last enemy and sin has disappeared. He says, but we feel compared with today's sordid, sin-cursed world that God has placed in a spot of beauty which gives at least a slight foretaste of his glorious kingdom and of the beauty God has in store for those that love him and serve him. That's what we have in God's headquarters campus. That's what we have in the campuses for Armstrong College and for the Summer Educational Program. You're listening to Stephen Fleury, and this is the Trumpet Daily Radio Show. If you'd like to email the program, you can send feedback to td at kpcg.fm. We thank you for joining us on today's show, and we'll see you tomorrow.